Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeeds, and welcome to APE's video notes for topic 7.7, .7, which is acid rain. Our objective for the day is to be able to describe acid deposition and also the effects that acid deposition has on the environment. And the skill that we'll practice at the end of today's video will involve identifying a research design method that's used. And so we'll talk about an experiment that we could do to measure the effects of acid deposition. So before we talk about how acid deposition forms and what its effects are, we need to understand the precursors or kind of the ingredients for acid rain. So those of course are going to be NOx and SO2. These are primary pollutants. So that means they're emitted directly from a source. That could be the smokestack of a coal fired power plant, or it could be your tailpipe in the car you're driving on the way to school. And so these are going to be precursors or pollutants that come before we actually form acid rain. So what are the major sources? Well, I've alluded to them already, but coal fired power plants are the major source of SO2 along with metal factories and vehicles that burn diesel fuel, which is higher in sulfur content. Those would be things like big trucks. And in terms of NOx, the number one source is going to be vehicle emissions. So let's take a look at how we can limit acid rain. Well, anything that's going to limit the amount of NOx and SO2 emissions is going to be pretty effective at limiting acid rain because those are the primary ingredients. So we could do things like raise the CAFE standards for vehicles. That would mean that vehicles would travel further on a single tank of gas and therefore emit fewer pollutants, especially NOx. We could have more public transit that takes more vehicles off the road and results in fewer NOx emissions. We could use more renewable energy resources. That's gonna take coal-fired power plants offline, result in less SO2 emissions. And we could have more efficient electricity usage because again, that also just reduces the amount of coal-fired power that we need to generate. Then we also have the Clean Air Act. And the Clean Air Act is a real success story when it comes to government intervention in the environment. So if we take a look at this map here of the United States and the sulfate content, sulfate ions are indicators of acid rain. Uh, and we look at how that has changed over time, we can see some of the impact that the Clean Air Act has had. So if we look at the late 80s, the early 90s, comparing that to the end of the first decade of the 2000s, what we're going to see is a dramatic decrease in acid deposition, especially in the eastern United States. One thing I want to point out is that acid deposition is worse in the eastern United States for a couple reasons. If you remember all the way back to topic 4.5, we have winds that drive from west to east in the Americas. And so this is going to drive this acid deposition that's formed in many of the rust belt areas of the Midwest. So places where there are metal producing facilities, coal fired power plants, a lot of vehicle emissions due to big cities. The wind is gonna drive those emissions eastward towards the Eastern US. And so we get higher levels of acid deposition forming in that region. But again, due to the efforts of the Clean Air Act, due to reducing our NOx and SO2 emissions through laws and regulations and technology, it's led to a dramatic decline in acid deposition formation. All right, we have so much awesome information on this slide that there just wasn't room for me. So I had to take my uh, webcam off the slide here. But what we're gonna do is go through a diagram that walks us through exactly how acid rain forms from a chemistry standpoint so that you have all of the molecules and equations down to understand this. So first, of course, we have the primary pollutants, SO2 and NOx, that contribute to acid deposition. These are the precursors. You can think of it as the ingredients. And so there we have our NO2 and our SO2 molecules in the atmosphere. This could also happen with nitrogen oxide, but I've just used NO2 here for the sake of consistency. And remember that they are primary pollutants, but they can form secondary pollutants. And so secondary air pollutants are pollutants that form in reaction with oxygen or water or sunlight. And so in this case, we have SO2 and NO2 combining with oxygen and water in the atmosphere, and that's going to form the secondary air pollutants, nitric acid and sulfuric acid. And so you can see here, uh, if we look at the chemistry of this, they have combined with those oxygen and water molecules to form new compounds. And these are secondary air pollutants, again, because they have formed in the presence of oxygen or water or sunlight. Then what we have is the dissociation of these acids. Acids are able to dissociate in the presence of water, meaning that they form ions, in this case, the nitrate ion and the sulfate ion, and then the dissociated hydrogen ion. So we have that represented in the cloud here with our H plus ions that have been separated 
from the nitrate ion and the sulfate ion. And then what's going to happen is those ions are going to dissolve into water droplets that fall as rain. And now we carry these H plus ions down onto the natural ecosystems where this rainfall happens. And so remember that the pH scale measures the concentration of H plus ions. And so as we get a lower pH, as we get a more acidic environment, that's actually an increase in the number of H plus ions or the concentration of H plus ions. And so this forest is now going to receive water droplets falling as rain with all of these H plus ions in them. And that's going to result in the soil becoming more acidic. It's going to result in the water sources becoming more acidic. And that can have consequences for plant growth, for aquatic life. And we'll spend the rest of this video focusing on what those consequences are. So now we'll look in a little more depth at the environmental effects of acid rain. And so as a reminder for our pH scale, acidity refers to a higher H plus ion concentration, but a lower pH. It's a little bit of a contradiction if you don't have a strong chemistry background. Um, so you have to try to really commit this apes fact here to memory so that you have this and understand this when we're dealing with pH and with acid deposition. And so of course, when these water droplets with more H plus ions fall, down to earth, they're going to lead to soil and water acidification. The problem is that these H plus ions can displace or leach other positively charged soil nutrients. So those are things like calcium and potassium that plants need in order to grow. Magnesium is another example. And because the H plus ions are positively charged, they essentially bump off these other positively charged nutrients from negatively charged clay particles that hold on to them. We'll use a diagram to understand this better here in a second. The other problem is that H plus ions make toxic metals like aluminum more soluble. So it bumps the aluminum off of other binding sites where it's stationary and puts it into the soil in concentrations that can be toxic to plants. It can also occur in aquatic ecosystems where aluminum can be toxic to the organisms that live there. Um, so this is a big problem. Not only can plants lose some of the important soil nutrients they have due to this acid deposition leaching them out, but they can actually be exposed to toxic substances such as aluminum. So here is a zoom in view of what actually happens to the roots of plants that experience really low pH, really acidic soil. So you can see how malformed uh, the root structure is here on the right of these two black and white images. And then we have the resulting effects on growth of the grass on the far right image here. And so you can see how much shorter the blades of grass are, how much it restricts root structure and therefore the growth of the plant. The other thing that I think is helpful to do is take a look at this diagram to the right and the bottom where we have a negatively charged clay particle. And so when the pH of the soil is around 4.8 or when it's a little more basic, we have a clay particle that's negatively charged binding to all of these positively charged soil nutrients. So again, these could be things like calcium, potassium, magnesium. These are all important nutrients for plant growth and they are needed for the plant to you know, survive and to thrive. Then as the soil pH decreases to 4.3 or eventually all the way down to 4.0, what we have are H plus ions, these little red dots here that are kind of creeping into the shot. And they are going to start displacing or kind of bumping off. I almost think of it as like a parking lot where the negatively charged clay particle has all these parking sites for these different positively charged ions. And the H plus ions take up these parking sites. They basically bump off calcium, magnesium, potassium. And that's going to be a problem. You can also see when we get all the way over to the pH of four, now we have a lot of aluminum ions that are binding to the clay particle. And remember, those aluminum ions are toxic to plants. And so when the plant takes those aluminum ions in, now it's going to experience stunted root growth and potentially even death. And so these are kind of the soil chemistry impacts of having a lot of H plus ions or having really acidic soil. And finally, we'll wrap up today by talking a little bit more specifically about how to mitigate or reduce acid rain. Limestone, which is an important base that occurs naturally in many ecosystems, is a great way to neutralize the acidic conditions in soil or water that has undergone or that have resulted from acid deposition. Uh, and so the chemistry behind this is that limestone is primarily calcium carbonate. And what happens is when there's H plus ions in a water source or a soil source, they react with calcium carbonate to form bicarbonate, HCO3, and then we give off a positively charged uh, calcium ion. And so what this is going to do is, in effect, take up those H plus ions 
absorb some of them so there's not so many of them in the soil or the water and it's going to neutralize and i put quotes around neutralize because we might throw that term around um, and what we mean by neutralize is move the ph closer to seven so absorb some of those excess h plus ions and mitigate some of those effects of the acid deposition so this can occur naturally some regions have just due to their geological you know formation have more limestone in their bedrock or in their parent material beneath the soil. And so that's gonna result in some natural buffering. But humans can actually simulate these effects themselves by crushing up limestone, grinding it up, you know, kind of into a powder, into smaller pebbles, and spreading that over an area that has been impacted by acid deposition. And then one other important way to illustrate this kind of chemistry is the idea that human structures, so whether these are monuments or steps or things that have been built with limestone can deteriorate pretty rapidly due to acid deposition. So here is a sculpture uh, where the features have kind of been blurred away and that stone has been corroded by acid deposition. This is a little bit of review from the beginning of the video, but just want to remind us of this again. Um, the most effective way to mitigate acid rain though is to try to prevent it from happening in the first place. It's a lot harder to solve acid deposition at the soil or the water level after it's happened uh, compared to solving it before it happens. And so again, any renewable energy resource that results in less SO2 and NOx emissions, we can do things like fluidized bed combustion or combusting coal at lower temperatures that res uh, results in fewer NOx emissions. And then dry and wet scrubbers can be added, you know, with chemical agents inside of them that can try to trap some of the SO2, prevent so much of it from being emitted. And so for existing coal power plants that are still going to be online, that are still going to be continued to use, these are two methods that can at least limit their contribution to acid deposition. So for practice FRQ 7.7 today, we're going to take a look at this experiment that scientists have set up. And I'll let you guys read through the introduction and the explanation of the experiment. But then what you're going to do is identify a likely hypothesis. You want to try to identify the independent variable. And then you want to think about how would these results change if crushed limestone were added to each of these soil pots using this experiment. 